Hello and welcome to Commodore 128 Assembly Language Programming. I'm Aaron and today we're going to work on the um, SHA hash, hash calculator some more. Um, we need a routine that can copy 64 bytes, the, the next 64 bytes from the message schedule in bank 1, in RAM bank 1, to where we're going to work on it in RAM bank 0. Um, talked about this a little bit in the last few videos that we're loading the file into bank 1 so that we have as much space as possible for a file almost a full 64k and then we need to copy the 64 byte chunks into bank 0 where we can do all the calculations on it so we need a routine to do that and that means that our routine needs to live in that first 1k of RAM um, just like our pad message routine did so we're going to be making another routine that works a lot like that, that copies a chunk of itself into that space and then runs itself there and then um, does its thing in that space. So I'm going to copy this, not the whole thing here, we don't need this whole thing, but I'm going to copy this just to get the structure. Um, actually, first thing I'm going to do is change this to a local label, um, making a Putting a dot in front of a label makes it a local label so that it's only effective within that zone. That way we can reuse the name copy part in, in our new routine that we're going to make that's going to work similarly. Um, okay, so I'm just going to copy that much of it. And then change the details here. So copy a 64 byte block from message schedule to our location at C100. C um, actually before I do, rather than rather than hardwire that, let's see, okay I've got WW as C, C100 so we can use that label instead of hardwiring that so to uh, Call this copy block. And this copy block is fine. It'll have its own copy part. Okay, so now get rid of this stuff. Let's see. Um, or no, I didn't want to do that. Put that back. Okay. So this is the basic structure of it, and then we've got to figure out what needs to be in here. This right here is the number of bytes to copy, so this will have to change once we get it, get it written. So the way this will work is when we call copy block, just like with pad message, copy block will copy this part of itself from copy part down, however, however many bytes we tell it to do, and it's going to copy it to 240. Now, I'm changing that. The, the other pad message could have could have as much of that space as it wanted because nothing else needed to go there. This routine is going to need 64 bytes of space within that block that it's sitting in in order to do the copy from bank 1 to bank 0 without having to switch back and forth between bank 1 and bank 0 in between every byte. We want to be able to copy the 64 bytes from wherever wherever the file, you know, wherever we currently are in the file in bank 1 into this space at 200 and then switch to bank 0 and copy the 64 bytes to C100 to where WW is. So to leave space for that 64 bytes I'm just going to leave the 64 bytes from 200 up to 23F and then we'll we'll put our code at 240. I think that'll be the simplest way to do it. So copy part here is going to get copied to 240 and then we'll jump to 240 when we're ready to run it. Um, let's make this so we remember to fix that later. Okay, so the first thing copy part needs to do is switch to bank 1 just like our other routine and at the end of it I'll go ahead and grab it here and needs to switch back back to bank 0 although in this case it won't quite be at the end but we'll get to that. 
Okay, so once we get switched into bank 1, we need to copy 64 bytes from from wherever we currently are. We've got a pointer into the file, into the file in, in bank 1, which is going to start out at 400. That's where we copy a file to, um, to 400 in bank 1, because that's the first memory location above our shared space that's free to use. So. Um, that value is going to be in message P. And if we come back over here. If we go to init, our init routine, we, we were setting message P to 2000 just as, as a place to put some data that, to test with, basically, um, so that we could have some data at 2000 to copy and, and do our computation on. So that's going to need to change. Um, let's see, stored that there. Okay, so that just needs a change to 04 to put message P at 400 to start it out there. And then we're going to walk up through as we go through the file. Um, yeah pointer to current location and P starts at 400 okay and that's in bank one I can over that um, I better make sure you can see all this all right so we're gonna start message P out at 400 and then let's see find where we're using that. Okay, prepww here, one of the steps in prepping the message schedule is copying the 64 bytes, and so we had put that in here to just copy from message p to um, wwr to the, to the location of the computation. That's not going to happen anymore because we need our special routine. We can't just copy because we've got to get at it over in bank one, so we need our special routine to do that. Um, so we're going to have to replace this stuff. <coughs> we're going to have to replace this stuff with that call to copy block. I think that should be all we need to replace. Now. We can't just use this code because, like I said, we, like here, we, you know, we were just doing a jump to F copy MM. We can't do that because that's not going to be down in our shared memory at 200 something. Um, so this this code, this copy block code, is going to need to be its own piece of code that can be copied down there. Um, but when we get it done, we'll need to come back here and replace that. Um, So, once copy block is switched to bank one, it's going to copy. Let's, see, let's add a little. Let's add a little comments here. Copy 64 bytes from message P to 0200. Switch to bank zero. Let's say switch to bank one. That's the first thing to do. Copy 64 bytes to 200, and then copy 64 bytes from 200 to WW, which is going to be C C100, but we won't hardwire that in. All right. So once we get to this point, then it's pretty straightforward. We want to load. An index register um, and start a loop. Load A from, let's see, or actually we want to use, okay, that's that's where I've got to think, okay, which index register, because if we're going to use the, the addresses in message P, And then we're going to store it 
into w, w, comma, y. Okay, so that should be okay. We don't need to do indirect on the second one. Or, yeah, we... No, we don't. W, w is not an address holding a pointer. It just simply is an address. It's just an alias for an address. Um, I should probably have a... I should probably have a system for kind of keeping the two things straight. Um, some kind of... Some kind of um, convention for saying, okay, these things, maybe maybe capital letters should be addresses, you know, direct addresses, and uh, pointers should be lowercase or something like that, which I guess is what I'm doing here. But, okay, and then increment x, compare, sorry, y, I'm using y, not x, compare y to... Um, 64, and then branch if not equal back up to there so that we're copying 64 bytes to the location. Okay, then we come back to bank 1, and we're going to do basically the same thing. So let's get the same code, except this time it's going to be switched the other way around. We're going to load A from... No, we're going to load A from... No, sorry, I, I was getting, I was jumping ahead here. WW is the the eventual de destination. First, we have to go to two, two hundred, because we've got to copy it from our message, our message schedule, our our file that's in bank one. We've got to copy it from there, which is going to be somewhere from four hundred up. It's going to start at four hundred and walk its way up. We've got to copy that to two hundred, switch banks, and then copy it from two hundred to WW. So we got to load A from here to 200, store that into WW. Okay, I think that should all be okay, because we only need the, the incremental, or we only need the indirect stuff right there. All right, so at that point then, it should have it copied to the proper location. Um... Okay, so that's copy part. That gets copied to 240 and run right here. And then because we jump right here, when copy part returns, it'll return back to whatever called copy block. Now that may not be what we want to do. So I was that's one thing I was thinking about was when we come back, is there anything else we want to do? before returning to whatever called this. Um, and what calls this is going to be that other routine, um, what was it, prep www. So basically we could put some more, we could change this to a JSR and put some more code right here or and then return or we could leave this as a jump and add that same code over in prep www. Basically, the only thing that really needs to happen here is we need to add 40 or we need to add 64 to message P. Once we once we're done with this, we need to move message P up 64 bytes so that when it's time to get the next block, it's pointing to the right place. Um, so, like I said, we could do that right here, or you know. We could add it to copy part, but we don't want to make copy part any longer than necessary because we're, we're fitting this in. However long copy part is, it's got to fit into our 160 byte space that we have at 200 along with the 64 bytes that we're copying. I don't see that being a problem, but um, you know, there's, there's no sense in pushing it. Um, all right, so that's copy block. So let's go down to prep www then. If we change all this to just JSR copy block, that should copy. Yeah, that, that all seems correct. I'm just just want to make sure I don't take out anything here that's necessary. Um, Copy the 64 bytes of the next block of M into the first 64. Yeah. 
so WWR at some point yeah right here in init gets set to uh, C100 so that's all that's correct okay that even that may actually even be unnecessary but we'll come back to that all right so let's take all that out all right so when we come back here then we need to check or we need to add 64 to message p so that's easily enough done we load a from message p um, clear carry add with carry 64 um, store that back into message p branch if carry clear ahead otherwise increment message p plus one and then there's the plus okay so what i'm doing here we're adding 64 to a two byte value so we add 64 to the low byte and then if that carried then we need to increment the high byte okay, we've done we've done that a few times now so it shouldn't be too weird all right now the next question is what do we do or how do we stop when we get to the end of the file um, let's see load file here loads the file and then it puts the end of the file which is actually the byte right beyond the end but it puts it at file end and then pad message updates file end after padding the message so that file end ends up pointing to the byte right past the end of our file however wherever it's been padded out to file end points to the very next byte so it's always going to point to the first byte of the next block that we're not using. So we need to stop as soon as the next block would point to would would equal file end would be the same as file end. Um, that's simple enough. The question is where do we want to check for that at? When do we want to check that? Um, let's see. we probably want to check that after the last thing we do we know there's always going to be at least one block now we don't have any error checking in this really what to speak of and so that's something we'll have to work on later but assuming it's able to load a file then we're always going to have at least one block because the spec says even with a zero length file you always add one bit a single one bit and then pad and so you're always even with a zero length file you're going to have a one bit and then a bunch of zeros padding out to the end of the the block so you're always going to have at least one block so we don't need to check before we do it we just need to check after the first block so i would say either here after update hashes or even within update hashes let's see what update hashes does it's pretty short um, so we could put something in there. Um, let's see. Well, let's just do another routine. So check if end. All right. So. that here this and we check if we've reached the end of the file all right 
and for now we'll just have it quit basically we'll just have it stop um, if we're at the end but what this needs to do then is compare the value of message p to the value of file end and see if they're the same so we can do that by saying okay let's let's load a from message p compare to file end and then branch if not equal head because if those aren't equal we don't need to bother comparing the others we already know that we've you know that, that they're unequal then we would load a from message p plus one the high byte compare that to file end plus one the high byte and let's see branch if not equal head again and then if we get here we break and then here's where we're branching ahead to I don't know, let's just put it here okay so if they're not equal then we branch ahead to here and return and then it can go on and do another block if if the if they are equal then it checks the high bytes and if they're not equal it branches ahead again to, to do another block. But if they are equal, if, bo if both low bytes and high bytes are equal, then we break. All right. And as it stands right now, we're only doing a single block anyway, but um, I guess we've got to let that, let that work because now prepww is going to call our copy block and that's really the first thing that we need to check that's the first new thing that we need to check and make sure it works so what we expect to happen is for prepww to copy the block into place from bank one by using copy block and then do all the computation on it check if it's at the end and then break out now um, let's see here the file that we're currently using is is two blocks. It's long, so um, oh, that's okay. Um, well, let's see. I'm not sure anymore. I don't remember anymore what was in these files. Um, Let's use hello2. I'm pretty sure it's short. I think it was the one we were originally using. Um, that's only six characters, so... Alright. So let's use hello2. I think it was just... I, I guess we can find out. Let's go to the monitor here. Load. And let's load it to 2000. Cannot open it. How would that be? Oh. Yeah, because I'm, I'm in the monitor, not in the... Gotta load it from 8000. Yeah, that's the one. That's the short one. It just has hello world. So we'll use that one as our test because we only want it to do one block for now. Um, all right. So save everything here. Um, over here. All right, we got a problem. Label name on line 32, not in the leftmost column. Uh, I don't see the problem with with this line. Is it maybe in a different file? No. Label name not in leftmost column. Oh, bump, not jump. Jeez. Or not 
jump either. Branch is not equal. That's what I wanted there. I've got bumping or I, I don't know. I got something. Compare. That's what I want there. Gee whiz. Something confused. Okay. No value given in a subzone at line 48. What does that mean? Oh, we have to fill this in. All right. So we need to get it to compile first, so let's just put a zero in there. Or not compile, we need to get it to assemble. Because we need to figure out how long this copy part is going to be. Alright, so let's assemble now. And then we need to load the program. And now we need to look at it. Alright, so if we look back here at our code, copy block starts... Well, we added check if end right after the file name. The file name kind of stands out because if you look, that's right here. It doesn't it, it, it doesn't turn in or I mean it does turn into code in this case, but it turns into kind of weird code that you would never actually write. And that we certainly don't have in this program. So there's hello two, and then the code for copy or the code for check if end is right here. So copy block starts at 13 to D right here. And so coming back, we're looking for the part copy part of copy block starts where we switch to bank one and goes down to where we return. So coming back over here, Here's the part, so there's the jump at the end of the, the opening of copy block. So here's the part where it switches to bank 1. That starts at 13.3D. I'm going to make a note of that over here. Uh, I can't right now. 13.3D, let's just try to remember that. And I'll never be able to remember that. 13.3D, it starts there, and then it goes down to, there's the return, at 13.66. So if we add one to that to subtract, 13.67. Alright, so what's the difference between those two? Um, well, here's, here's probably the simplest way to do it. 13.67 is 4967 13 3D is that what I said? I'm already forgetting. Yes. Is 4925. So 4967 minus 4925 is 42 bytes. So our little section that gets copied is only 42 bytes. So we definitely don't have a problem with space. Um, and so up here we need to say compare that to 42. So we're going to copy 42 bytes, which is going to be this copy part. That's going to go down to here, and then it's going to jump to it. All right. So now that that's in place, we can actually we can load the new program, and I guess we can run it. Um, see what happens. Searching for Hello 2. We broke out at 13.1a. Let's see where 13.1a is. That's, uh, okay, that's the break at the end of our stuff right here. That's this break right here, because it always adds 2 to it. Um, so that's the break at the end of all our jumps. So if we come back here, it broke out right here. Which means check if end may not have worked because I really expected, since we only had one block, I expected check if end to break right here. So that's the first thing to figure out is why did that not happen? Um, all right, so we we'll figure that out. Message P is at 76, and file end is at 84. So let's check both of those. 76. That's holding something weird. 
Did I say 76? I did. Why does message P have such a weird value? Hmm. 60 D9. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and file end is at 84. Okay, file end is fine. That's where we would expect it to point after one, you know, after one, or that's where we would expect it to point when the block, when the original block is short enough that padding it out only makes it 64 bytes. So it's pointing to, to the six, it's pointing to the 65th byte basically. Um, but I don't understand why message P is where it is. Maybe something else is messing with message P because um, okay. Oh oh oh. What have I got going on here? Prep W W. This seems seems okay. We're loading. This is just adding 40 to message P, so that's all right. This stored zero. This is at the very beginning. Stores zero in the low byte. Stores four in the high byte. So that's that's correct. And then this is just the check at the end. Nothing else is messing with it. Um, I don't think anything here messes with it. No. Hmm. Interesting. It's possible that that's a zero page location that something else messes with after a program ends, but I don't, I haven't seen that before. Um, I guess the thing we can do, back up here to the stop the top. The thing we can do is start the program and break right at the beginning and then see what message P is after each of these jumps and see where it's getting messed up. So we'll just break at the very beginning and run it and then we can check message P. Okay, so init hasn't run yet. So after we go through init Now it should be set. Okay, so now it's set to four. Uh, come back to the code. Okay, why am I going into a routine? I think that's the I think the monitor is goofing me up, not the Okay, we're gonna reset things. Okay. Alright. For whatever reason it's starting out at D thousand right now. Um let's load fresh just in case I forgot about something. And then let's go. Okay. Why does it take off into F seven two B on the world?
think I'm just not using the monitor right, but I don't know what I'm doing wrong with it here. 13D2. Thirteen D two is starts out with load A six. Okay, so that's load file, I believe. Yeah, that's load file. So that's correct. the monitor has taken me off through that. Oh, well, let's do it this way. Let's delete our breakpoint. Okay. Um, let's put the breakpoint at 1306 and then just run it. We stopped at 13.06. Okay. Message P is still what it should be. All right. Then, oops. Sorry. Okay. Then after we... Okay, so 13.06 is the third one, I think I said. Okay, well, let's just delete that breakpoint. Move another, do another one at 1309. Breaks at 1309. And then check it. It's still good. Okay. Delete that breakpoint. Put the next one at 130C. broke at 13.0c, message P is still good. Alright, delete that breakpoint, break at 13.0f, and still good. Okay, next one will be 13.12. I guess I don't have to give it the number. 1312. And that's where it gets screwed up. Alright, so what do we got going on at 1312? That's our next to last jump before the break. So that is update hashes. Update hashes is clobbering message P for some reason. Why is it doing that? Okay. Okay. Well, this is doing stuff to the hashes, which start at VA. Which start here at 18. And it must be running into message P up here somehow. That's weird. So, it's only supposed to do 32 bytes. Must be doing more than that. We're starting at 30, well, we're starting at 31, 1F, and indexing from hash indexing from hash values up to that. So hash values. I guess that's in our other file one of the other files. Oh, that's in um, I don't even 
remember now. Not that one. There it is, constants, okay. There's hash values. So, come back. We load A from hash values, comma 31. Add that to VA, comma 31. Store it back into hash values. And then we transfer X to A. This was a little, a little trick here to make sure that we didn't carry from one 4-byte value to the next. So that's all that's going on there is making sure we don't do that. We transfer X to A, end it with 3, branch if not equal, ahead. Otherwise, we clear the carry. And then we go on by decrementing X, comparing X to FF, which is where it'll be once it's done with hash values. Hmm. Well, this all looks okay. Um, actually, you know what? If it broke at the beginning of this one, this isn't the one. Duh, duh, duh. If it broke here, before it went to update hashes, which I believe is the case. Yeah, if it broke at 13.12, that's before it went to update hashes. So it got screwed up by the routine before that. It got screwed up by comp step three. Okay, so what, what goes on in comp step three then? This was all checked, and this was all tested, but maybe maybe it was goofing that up in some way I didn't realize. Um, there's nothing in here about message P. But something's goofing it up. All right, so what we want to do then is spend half our time debugging. That's okay. What we want to do then is set our breakpoint at the beginning of comp step three, or right before we jump to comp step comp step three. So that's fourteen thirteen. Um, set a break at fourteen thirteen, and then run. Okay, we broke out. All right, message P is what it should be. And so then we can start walking through this. Now I'm gonna do what I did the other day and um, put these on the same window here so I can kind of keep an eye on both things at the same time. Uh, let me resize things a bit. Okay. So, I better shrink this just a bit more. All right. So comp step three starts. Yeah, load A. Store that into Windex. All right. And so at this point, yeah, should still be good. Now we start walking through this. It shouldn't. If I say next, it shouldn't go into these routines. So 16OB must be F2, 15FD is FCH. We'll do one more. And then we come to, okay, load X from 38. So now let's check our values. Still good. All right. Continue. Load A from 60, with, with 64. Jump to F add. All right, and so how are our values now? Still good. Now we've loaded X with T1. We're going to load A with V8, the address of VH, which is 70. We're going to jump to F add. 
Let's see how it is now. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, I'm up talking because I don't know what's coming. Um, all right, load A with temp two. Jump to F copy WWM. Check it now. Still good. Uh, what happened to there? Load A with 44. Where was I there? Oh, okay. Uh, four. I might have gotten a step ahead of myself here. We loaded X with 38, which I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's T1. Loaded A with 34, which was VA, or VH, sorry. And then jumped to F add, and then loaded A with temp 2, which is 44. Let's check that just to be sure. Yeah, temp 2 is 44. So right now we're to here. So I'll go ahead and do one more step. And now check them. Still good. So now we've loaded X. We're going to load X with T1. Load A with temp2. And jump to F add. Check them here. Still good. Jump to F1. Still good. Jump to F madge. Now they're messed up. So F Madge goofed up message P. Okay. Now let's go. Well, let's continue to see if anything else goof, goofs it up. Right now we're here. We're about to load. Or next step, we'll load X from T with T two. Then load A from F Madge Res, that's that. And now we're going to jump to F Add. And now let's check the values. That didn't change it. Okay, do I go? That may be the only thing. Alright, so F Madge goofed up. Goofed up message P somehow. How did it do that? That's unfortunate because this is a <laughs> this is something that was tested, but just because it worked correctly on the you know on the stuff we wanted it to work on doesn't mean it couldn't have goofed anything else up. So nothing. It doesn't. It doesn't reference message P at all, so something it did ran into message P somewhere. So let's look at what comes, what is right before message P. There it is, F match res. Oh, I see the problem already. These are all four byte values. F match res is going to be a four byte value and it's going to run into message P. That's the problem. Um, That is fixable. We just need to put message P somewhere else. So let's put it up here. Let's put it at 5E. We got some room there. Or actually, let's put it at 5-6. That'll be easier for me to remember, probably, maybe. 5-5. Five, five. Count is a one byte counter, so we have room right here at 5-5. 5-5 five, five. Five, five might be easiest to remember. Okay. Well, that was fun debugging. Um, let's assemble again. Let's do a full reset here. It's not a full reset, but full enough. Load. Load it. Delete our breakpoints. And go. Okay, broke at 132D. I think that's what I wanted. 
13 2D? Yes, because that's at the end of check if, check if whatever, check if end. If we come back over here, come back to our code. Yeah, 13 1D is this break right here, not this one up here. So it broke out after checking the message P equal file end, which is what I wanted. All right, so if we check message P now at 5, 5, 5, 6, their message P is, and that equals file end. Okay, good deal. So now the question is, did our copy work? So if we check, let's, let's exit here. Let's come over to the native monitor because it's easy here to check bank 1. So there's bank 1. We only care about the first 64 bytes from... FC down to zero 09. Um, in fact, let's look at it this way. 1043F. There's the first 64 bytes. So, did that get copied where we wanted it to into bank 0, C100, C3F? And it did. Okay. And it's probably still at. 200 also, but not necessarily. Yeah, it's, it's gotten a little, it's gotten a little clobbered because this, the area that we're using as our buffer to copy it from one side to the other, is also used by the monitor. And so as soon as we break out to the monitor, as soon as our program breaks out and goes to the monitor, it's going to screw that area up. That's okay. As long as it, as long as it's not touched while our program is running, that's what matters. Okay, let me move this back to the other window, so I can have a full window again. Um, Alright, so we have our copy block routine. It works. Now, one thing I was thinking about is this is going to do this, this is going to do this part right here. Copy these 42 bytes every time it needs to copy a block from one side to the other. That's not really necessary because once you know once it has copy part in place it could just call it it doesn't need to copy it each time um, it would be enough to copy it the first time and then not have to do it again after that um, so what we could do here is check and see if message p is still 400 and if it is then we do the copy, otherwise we just jump. Um, so why don't we do that? Let's uh, go here. Let's load A with message P. Check if it's been moved yet. If it's not, if it hasn't been moved, it'll be zero. So we'll branch if not equal, if it's if it's not equal to zero, then it has been moved, and so we can branch ahead to something. Otherwise, we'll load for message P plus one, compare that to four, and if that's not equal, then it's been moved. And let's see. You, know, you always have to think about how to do these things. Um, if message B has been changed, we don't need to copy this any we don't need to copy copy part into place anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. We just need to jump. And so we can branch if branch if not equal head, and both of our branch of heads can go to right here, where we just jump. Now is that is that correct? Do I have that right? Compare the low byte of message P to zero. And if it's not zero, go ahead and jump, because it means we've already done some blocks, at least one block. 
then compare the high byte 4, and again, if it's not equal, jump ahead. Okay. I think that'll do it. And that's not, you know, that's not adding a lot of complexity. And that way, when we do copy, because what we were going to do is we were going to have to copy 42 bytes into the 200 block just so that we could copy our 64 bytes into that block and then over to the other place. So we're adding, I don't know, another 30%, maybe, maybe not even that. But anyway, we're adding a, you know, something. Not a lot because this is still something that. <coughs> This is still something that only happens once for every 64 bytes, and we've got other things that are happening like a thousand times for every 64 bytes. So it's not a big deal, but I just thought that's a little bit of efficiency that we can get for very little cost right here. Um, okay, we're almost in an hour here, so I'm going to assemble that to make sure that works. Just, just to make sure that that's not screwed anything up. <coughs> okay, still breaks at 13 2D like before. <coughs> it's a good thing I'm about done. Getting dried out here. Um, all right, so let's come back here. So that was kind of interesting. We found a bug in something that had already been tested, and you know, was thought to be reasonably solid and it turns out it wasn't because it was running into another value that we weren't using yet so that's the sort of thing you have to run down once in a while um, all right let's look at the organization here we've got a copy routine now that works so I think next time Basically, I think all our pieces work. I'll have to think about it a little bit, see if I'm missing anything, and look through the, look through my stuff here. But I think all the pieces work. Now we need to work on the display and the way to basically the way to display the output when it's done, but also the output as the program is working. Because I'd like to see, I'd like to show progress, like a like a progress bar sort of thing. Um, I'd like to show the hash values as it's going along, so we've got to plan how those are going to be displayed on the screen. Um, probably going to use the 80 column screen for this because we have those routines, um, which will be useful. Uh, plus, there's just plain more space on that screen um, as far as for text because you know, of the 80 columns. Um, we can show more characters there. And I'd like to basically what I've got in mind is I'm, I'm thinking back to on the old. Um, Commodore bulletin board, um, the heck was it, Q-Link, when you downloaded a file it would show each block as, as it was downloading. You could actually, that's how fast downloading was, you could see each 256 bytes coming through and so it would show a block of two 256 bytes and then show the next block and then show the next block. Um, and so you, you, know, you could actually see your progress that way. So I've kind of got something like that in mind where we show each block of 64 bytes, just show it as the as the hex values, and show the the hash value hex values also as they change, as it's working, and also have a, a progress meter sort of thing that says block number one, block number two, and so on. Um, and we also have to do an interface to allow a person to select a file, um, and there's a few different ways to do that. The 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 simplest way, but also the, the, the least user-friendly way, would be to just say, type in the name of the file. But, you know, because on the Commodore you don't have, you know, it's not easy necessarily for a user to see what, what, uh, what files are on the disk. Um, it's relatively easy, but, you know, you know, you can do a directory, but I got an out-of-memory error because I crashed something. Um, but anyway, it's a lot easier within a program if you can show the files that are on the disk and allow a person to select one somehow. So we're going to do something like that. I haven't decided exactly what yet. So we still got some work to do, but I think the the other than other than finding bugs, I think the computation parts are done. It's just a matter of working on the display and being able to get get the values out and get them displayed. And then I'm also going to want a, a way to store the hash value because we're talking about um, 
yeah, we're talking about 64 character, a 64 character string, which isn't that easy a thing to, you know, you certainly can't memorize it. It's not that easy a thing to write down. So we went away to, once we've processed file and say, here's the hash, we want a way to be able to save that hash as a file in a, in a text file or something. So that's going to be part of it too. So that's it for this time. And I hope that was interesting. And I did want to mention I got a donation from a couple of fellows. Um, I'm not going to say their names because I think they wanted to be um, anonymous. But um, if they if they don't want to be anonymous, I'll get their names and put them in a contributor's file. So um, thank you to them and to anyone else who comments or anything. I've had some comments lately too, which are always appreciated. Um, it's, 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 good to, it's always good to know people are watching. Um, and it's always good to get ideas from people too. So that's it for this time, and thank you for watching.